But I would like to welcome you now to Core Voices. Thank you for being in this space with us every week. This is your space where we can talk about anything that you want. And especially the taboos, the things that are difficult, that's the whole intention of having this space. And today I think that we're all gonna learn a lot more about the intention of this space. I've already received a lot of questions in my social media, in my emails, and even in my phone, in my text messages. So um, I'm glad that you guys are interested to converse. And that's what we wanna do today. Whatever is on your mind, if a lot of people were asking things about my journey, and I'm happy to share that with you. I'm, I'm actually excited to share that with you today. Um, I see more people jumping on. Prithinder from Washington, Manjeet Singh, Sarbjeet Singh from India. Thank you for tuning in. And today, I am your guest, and you are the host. So I am going to start with answering some of the questions that you've already sent to me. And I'm going to be keeping an eye on the comments. So if there's something that you want to ask me, please pop it in the, in the comments and I will answer your questions, whatever it may be. It could be related to life, to Sikhi. You might want to know about my journey, whatever it is. If, if you think that I can help, um, that's what I would like to do. So I will begin with some of the questions that popped into my emails um, and then I'll hit the ones that were on social media as well. I have been asked to talk about core voices and what inspired this space to be created. So this is not the happiest of stories but I'm going to be, as always, I'm going to be very honest with you and very open. Um, the whole idea of core voices was to have a space where we as a community can come together and talk about things that are difficult. We have been trained over years and decades and such a long period of time and conditioned psychologically to suppress what we feel and what's actually going on. We're taught from a young age to put on a mask and pretend everything is okay and it doesn't matter what you might be going through at home or in your personal life we are encouraged to pretend to be okay, even when we are not okay. And the whole idea of this space is to break that culture and have conversation, talk about things that are difficult, try to find solutions. Sometimes it's just listening so that we don't feel alone. We know that there are others out there who might be going through similar things and their stories their successes might help us to get through our difficulties. That's the intention behind it. Um, for me personally, why I began Core Voices is to open up the conversation of sexual abuse and the whole Me Too movement in the Sikh and the Punjabi community. There's nowhere that we're talking about these things. There's nowhere where these issues are being addressed. And I can tell you that these are experiences that I have had firsthand in Punjabi and Sikh spaces. And that means in the spaces that we wouldn't expect. So you wouldn't expect these sorts of things to happen in families or in Gurdwaras or in environments where community gathers, but they do. And we don't talk about this. I have a lot of strong women around me who have been through incidences which are more horrific probably than the ones that I have been through. And they were never supported, they were never believed, the community didn't stand up for them. And this is why we need to make core voices successful because those voices need to be heard, those stories need to be told and we need to provide the right support for people in our community who need that help and not just in our community or people who need help through difficult situations. So this was the, the whole idea or the intention behind creating this space and having core voices as a safe, non-judgmental space where we can talk about things that are uncomfortable, 
whatever it may be. And that's the environment that we want to foster. Um, and yeah, that question's come in the comments as well. I've just answered that for you. Um, I am not confusing the Sikh religion and Indian culture. Um, sexual abuse exists in the Sikh community. It happens in Gurdwaras. It happens in family environments. It happens everywhere probably around you. Um, I can guarantee you, as um, I don't know who Worldwide Watch is, if you are male or female, um, but I can guarantee everybody who is watching, if you don't feel that sexual abuse in the Sikh community is an issue, then you are in an illusion. You are living in ignorance. And I don't mean that to be rude. I mean that to be honest. Every single female in your life has most probably had some sort of an encounter, especially the ones who are older than you. The younger generation, hopefully not, but people who are your age and older than you, if you were to speak to your parents, your mom, your aunts, your sisters, your friends, your siblings, your cousins, if you spoke to them and you asked them if they've ever been the victim of sexual abuse, it might just be verbal, but they will say yes. There are very few women in our community who have not experienced this. And I have sat down with my aunts, I have sat down with my elders and ask those women what their experiences were and their responses was that this is just how men behave this is just what they do so at functions we'll sit separate from them when they're drinking we won't be in that area and the reason for that was to protect themselves i never realized this i thought there was a segregation that you know the men have their little club and the women have their little club um but there was a reality behind it that I only discovered when I asked them that what, what, you know, why do you guys sit separately? And the response was because when men are drunk, you don't know what they're capable of. They don't know who's their wife and who's not their wife. Um, and I was quite surprised um, to have that as a response and for it to be so normal. Um, it was, it was quite scary to know that this this is what's happening right around us and we don't have a solution for it. Um, why is sexual abuse happening in Gurdwaras? Why isn't our community doing anything about it? This is a very, very good question. Why does it happen in our Gurdwaras? Because we are... Because we're allowing it to exist. We're hiding away from the real issues and we're trying to live in this little fluffy world that everything is okay. I know a lot of women, women that I respect and I love who have been raped in Gurdwaras and that is horrific, that is disgusting, that should not happen, that is not what the Gurdwara is about. But people, the individuals in the Gurdwara who behave this way, they, because they're men, they get protected and they serve a purpose in the committees. And I know that everything that I'm saying is going to poke some nerves for a lot of you. And I, I can't apologize because this is the truth. And it's about time that we had these conversations and we talked about this openly. Um, if we don't talk about it, we can't fix it. If you actually went on to Google, and you searched for sexual uh, predators or people who have committed any sorts of these acts, you will find that there are turbaned, bearded, Punjabi Sikh men. And many of them are involved in Gurdwaras. So the question is, what are we going to do about it? And it's not something that I can do anything about alone. That's why we have a community here. That's why you are core voices, not me. I'm just holding this space for you. If this is something that hurts you to know that this exists, then I ask you to step forward, reach in and offer your support so that we can actually make those spaces safe again. That is the purpose of Core Voices, that we come together and that we act together to make these things right. Um, Simran is asking, how, 
How can we start those conversations with the elders in a Punjabi household in hopes to simulate a positive change without causing offence within a family? I think it's easier when you're in groups of women. And um, if as um, a younger person in that space, if you go in without judgment and with curiosity and with empathy also, knowing that their journey hasn't been easy, knowing that it's been difficult, they've had struggles and they don't want to be quiet because they choose to be. They are quiet because nobody has ever supported them in the past. Nobody has ever believed them in the past and nobody's created a space where they can get justice in the past. So if they know that we we live in a different time, but you're not here to get justice for them unless that's what they want. You're just here to understand. If you enter that space with understanding and with listening, then they will meet you. They will meet you there. They will have that conversation. If you were to share and say, this is something that happened to me. Has this ever happened to you? Then you're going to open a conversation. You're going to see things unfold and you have to be prepared for it. You can't just go in naively thinking that they're going to say, nothing ever happened to me. I don't know what you're talking about. You have to be prepared if you want to enter that space. Um, can you handle what you might have to hear? And what are you going to do with it afterwards? Because in these conversations, sometimes we might take on somebody's trauma without realizing it. So please be cautious. Um, and you can always write to me at core Voices at gmail.com if you need any support in that space um so okay um drinking alcohol is associated with punjabi culture it's prohibited in sikhi baptized sikhs are forbidden from drinking yes i agree but but that's not the truth there are a lot of baptized sikhs that you call amritari sikhs who wear the dress but they live a double life. We are not protected from our flaws just by wearing a turban or wearing a beard and wearing a kirpan. The, the objects mean nothing if we don't have the values and the connection within us. And I say objects because that's all they are. When you wear them and you contradict the values of, of Sikhism, Sikhi, right? Drinking and alcohol and intoxicants, yes, they're forbidden. But there have been countless incidents where people who work inside the Gurdwara have had raids done by random groups in the community and they've uncovered bottles of alcohol in Gurdwara premises. There are many Sikh households where they will have Guru Granth Sahib at home and they will also have alcohol in their home as well. That is not acceptable that is not okay but the community has found loopholes the question is what are we going to do it's not about defending and feeling threatened because today you get me and today I am going to be honest with you I'm not going to dress it up I'm not going to fluff it up I'm going to be just very honest with you because this is what we don't have in our community I wish that when I had asked questions, somebody had been honest with me instead of giving me the fluffy, cloudy version. Now, sexual abuse exists in our community. Alcohol abuse exists in our community. And in our, I mean the Sikh and the Punjabi community immediately. But these are problems which spread wider. And they are also our concern as well, because we are meant to be here to uphold good values as Sikhs and support others through their difficulties. We can't do that when we're struggling ourselves. So when you know somebody who dresses like a Sikh, acts like a Sikh, right? They go to the Gurdwara or they say that they do X, Y, and Z, and this qualifies them to wear that label. But you also know that they engage in things which contradict the values of Sikhi, such as alcohol abuse, such as, you know, whatever else it may be, then what are you going to do to help that person through their difficulties? Because they're only reaching to those things because they're struggling with something in their life and they don't have a solution. And because they don't have a solution, they're trying to suppress their emotions. So we can blame 
but it's not about blaming because it doesn't change anything. And if we want to make a change, we have to actually sit together. We have to sit together and figure out what's the problem, what could be possible reasons for that problem to exist, and how can we start to rectify it? Yes, ideally, we want to point the finger at the Gurdwara, but we know that that's not a practical solution. So I ask you, what can we do to try to address some of these problems? And like I said, if these are things that you feel passionate about, reach out to me. OK, reach out to me and we can start to put the work in to see what we can do. Right. It takes one person to make a change. And that person could be you. If you need support, I'm here to support you. And so is my team. Um, let's have a look at some of these questions. Right. So the mentalities exist in, in our Gurdwaras as a result of what the Mahants did. It's however it may have started. I'm not ignoring that fact of history. The problem right now is that we are still suffering the consequences of this. So it means that we have a responsibility to act in this space. And the question is, what can we do? What are we able to do? Or what are we willing to do? And most of the time, what I've found, unfortunately, is people will contact me and they'll want me to go and fix a problem for them. But when I ask them to get involved, they don't have time. They are busy with other things. That just means you're not passionate enough about it. Ideally, we want to live in a perfect world, but we don't want to do the work to make it perfect or ideal. It's a double standard. So how do we snap out of the double standard? Ask yourself, if you're really passionate about it. And if you are, ask yourself, what would you want someone to do if that was you? Okay, that's how we have to begin with it. We have to look at this as our family problem. We are an extended part of each other. This is our family. Humanity is our family. How are we going to show up for each other? How do we have those difficult conversations? And how do we try to support each other when we're struggling and we feel judged, right? If you know somebody who is not able to live up to their values of Sikhi and they're struggling with things like drugs or alcohol abuse, but they, they pretend to be Amritari, if you go and you tell them, you shouldn't be doing this, that's terrible, that's not going to change anything. You're not going to help that person. So you have to have their you have to have compassion to know that they're only in this situation because they're struggling. But if you're going to go in with your ego and with your judgment, you're not going to serve any purpose there whatsoever. And you should refrain from doing that. So please know what it takes to show up. Do you have love in your heart? Do you have compassion? Are you actually willing to be able to support somebody who's struggling? instead of pointing a finger and judging and saying, this is wrong and you shouldn't be doing this, or this is what you should be doing, but I'm not gonna do anything to help you. This is what you should be doing. That's not Sikhi. That's not Sikhi. If you wanna walk that path, what are you willing to do to help somebody else? That's what I ask you. Like The accountability is on us, each individual. That is really what it takes to make a change. How can we be more supportive to survivors of abuse in our community? I think I just answered that, that question. Compassion is first. Often we blame, we victim blame. We do that a lot as a community. I've seen it too many times and it's hurtful. That is not how you support somebody who needs help. Any survivor of abuse, whether that is sexual abuse, whether that is alcohol abuse, whether whatever sort of abuse that may be, if you don't show up with compassion, if you're not in your place of they are, you can't help them. You're going to aggravate the problem. So please, please, if you're not able to help, connect them with somebody who can provide them professional help. That's what you can do. And Sometimes we want to help, but we really actually don't have the resources to help. And in those situations, this is what we can do, is make that connection. 
hold a hand, take them to where they can get help from, be a support. You don't have to be the solution. What I'm not saying to you is that you have to go out there and fix everybody's problems and their problems are your problems. That's not what I'm saying. We have to be able to find a balance of looking after ourselves and showing up for others. How do we find that balance? The balance is when you're first connected with yourself and you know what's going on inside. Then you'll be able to hear somebody else with compassion. You'll be able to show up in a way that will be supportive to them instead of in a way that is supportive to your ego. Most of the time, we don't do seva. We don't know what selfless service means anymore because we're in this process of self-gratification. We do something good and then we post a picture of it on social media, right? That takes away the notion of it being selfless. Yes, we need to tell people about it. I agree. It's a very difficult balance, but the things that genuinely fall into that seva don't need to be broadcasted. They can stay gup, they can stay sacred, and you can still make a difference. So it's finding the right resources. And there are lots and lots of resources available on our website, which I'm going to put into the comments here, which is corevoices.org, where you can connect people who need support to resources that can help them. And there are plenty of professionals out there providing this support. Just going to scroll back through some of these questions. How do we facilitate a dialogue? with sexual harassment. It's challenging for the victims to come forward as it's challenging to hold entitled perpetrators accountable. This is a tough one because it's such a big problem and such a real problem in our community. We haven't yet opened the dialogue. We haven't yet begun to accept that this is actually happening. And it's difficult for most of us to listen to the fact that it happens in Gurdwari. We hear the stories, we brush it off, we think that's not real, it's make-believe. Unfortunately, it is real and it's not make-believe. It's only real when it hits home and I hope that it doesn't, but oftentimes it does and this is what we have to wake up to. We have to have better policies and accountability in place in these institutions. We can only do that once we've united as a community, as a people, and even in this space we could unite and say, okay, we few people, four or five of us, however many we choose to gather, we want to stand for this subject, for this particular topic, and we can advocate for it. We can step forward and we can fight that battle and we can make a difference. That is how change has been made and will continue to be made when people use their voices and speak up. And we want victims to be able to come forward and get support. Unfortunately, our institutions, our gurdwari and even our family structures don't always support that. We, we rarely believe the victim. We think that they must have made it up or misunderstood or been in the wrong place or lied about it or something or blah, blah, blah. We will make some very ridiculous excuse for it. That doesn't justify it. That doesn't put us in the clear we still have to address it. And it's not it's not been done before. This is why I'm reaching to you and I'm saying, reach back, step forward and say, we want to advocate for this. We will help to get in the front line and make sure that there is some sort of policy or accountability in every single Gurdwara that protects our women and our young people. And I say young people because this happens to boys and to girls as well. Um, please step in. This is the only way that we can make a change. Like I said, I don't have a magic wand. I wish I did. I wish I could make everything perfect, but I can't. But together we can, and that's what we need to do. Okay, I'm going to scroll through your questions here and then I'm going to hit some of the ones that rolled in on the emails as well. Um, can we use the system of the five? I mean, I've, I'm assuming that means Panjabiare to make sure that they have some sort of... Okay, then car. Okay, um, like a penance. In the Gurdwari, yes, we, we could do that. That would be an ideal, but I don't 
personally, I mean, I, I don't want to be a party pooper, but I don't think that's going to work. It hasn't worked until now. And if, if that was enough, we wouldn't have this issue. I think the first step is for us as a people to gather and first identify that this is an issue. Once we agree that it's an issue, we can find solutions, we can put in policies, we could build that for our Gurdwari, and then we could have Gurdwari implement that if they know that there's a system to follow. I don't think they know where to begin, to be honest with you, because it's a scary subject and nobody wants their Gurdwara to get shut down or, you know, for it to be labelled in a derogatory way. But this could be how we do it. If any of you are passionate, tell me, reach out to me and let's start putting something together. Um, what about being good role models for others to emulate? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, that's the only choice that we have, is try to model the behavior that we want to flourish in our community. That's the whole idea of being a Sikh, is to be a beacon of hope, to be a lighthouse almost, to shine that ray of hope at the end of the tunnel to say, hey, you don't have to give up, you can make it through this, and you don't have to sell out. There's, there's a better way. And yes, we can do that by modeling it. So we have to change ourselves. We have to hold ourselves accountable. Um, Brithinder Singh is asking, since you're a Rababi, can you share how Kirtan could help? Okay, so Kirtan is what I've used in my life. And I'm, I'm, I think I'm gonna come to that through some of the other questions because there's a lot of questions that rolled into my emails about my journey. And that might be a good place to start. So I've been asked, do I come from an Amritari family? And if I can talk about my childhood and the challenges I faced and how that affected my life's trajectory. You've basically just asked me to tell you my whole life story. I don't think we have that much time, but I'll try to give you the shorter version, okay? Um, so I do not come from an Amritari family. I come from a Punjabi family and I make a clear distinction between Punjabi and Sikh. As Punjabi people, we are all, most of us, sorry, because not, not everybody watching might be Punjabi, so please excuse that assumption. But when we are born into an Indian family, I'm, I'm, gosh, I'm using all the wrong words right now, but we're gonna do this anyway. <laughs> Let's pretend that bit didn't happen. Um, most of us who call ourselves Sikh are actually Punjabi. And that's a very strong statement and you're not gonna like it. But the reason that I say that is our parents have now carried the name Gaur and Singh as a label of cultural identity. It has nothing to do with being Punjabi. Therefore, technically, you can't use those names unless you're actually a practicing Sikh. Now, what's the definition of a practicing Sikh? Does that mean to be Amritari? Not according to Guru Nanak. So the journey of Sikhi is about learning and evolving and being ready to grow. And a lot of things I'm saying are gonna be very controversial for a lot of you, but these are my opinions and my views. So I'm gonna share them. I believe that Punjabis and Sikhs are very different. We may be born in the land of Punjab, or that's where our parents may come from. It doesn't automatically make you a Sikh. You cannot inherit Sikhi. Sikhi is a choice. It is a conscious commitment that you make to yourself for your own development to commit to being better every single day. In my opinion, that does not mean that you have to actually go through the process of being baptized, being Amritari, to be on the path of Sikhi. I believe that that's a milestone in the journey, but that doesn't qualify you, that, as in that's not the only way to qualify to earn the name Kaur or Singh. If you want to attach those names with your identity, then you have to ask yourself, 
What are you doing every day to check yourself? What are you doing every day to ask yourself how you can be better? What did I do in my day today that I can improve for tomorrow? That layer of reflection allows you to grow, allows you to learn from life, which is what Sikhi, the Sikhi of Guru Nanak is about. That was why it was created, that you are reflecting and connecting with yourself. This is about me. How do I hold myself accountable for everything I did and said today? What do I want to improve tomorrow? And how am I going to use that to improve the day after? That process of learning with every step and every breath is what it means to be a student of life, to be a sick. Now, if we want to have those labels, we've got to do the work. You can't just put on the uniform of a police officer and say that now you serve for the police force. It doesn't work like that. You have to go through a process of training and Sikhi is no different. Guru Gobind Singh asked for a head. That qualified you, right? Now, most of us don't want to make that commitment, but we still want to have all the perks of what, what is attached of being called a sick. It doesn't work that way. We have to, we have to raise the bar. We have to uphold that standard of quality. Now, I didn't mean to digress, but I wanted to just give you context about how I connect with these terms. I come from a Punjabi family. My parents went to the Gurdwara every Sunday. I also was made to go on a Wednesday to go for like various classes of Gatka or Punjabi school or whatever else was going on. And that was about as far as my connection with Sikhi went. I would go to Gurumat camps once in a year and be immersed in like the historic context of what it means to be a Sikh, but not so much the practicality or connection of Gurbani that I was looking for or that would have helped me. That's important because it helps to springboard the rest of my journey. I had, like many of you, many challenges in my childhood, many, um, from being one of a few, like just a handful of brown people in my school. It was tough. There were a lot of white people everywhere and I, I suffered racism from a very young age. Um, we used to have a, a corner shop and the area that I lived in, there were more, more white people there than anything else. And they didn't understand the cultural differences. So the only way they knew how to deal with it was by abusing us, by being mean to us and being racist to us. So I had to learn to deal with that from a very young age. Within my household, we had our own difficulties. Um, very, what do I say, complex family dynamic with extended family who were just very terrible people and not very supportive. And that was difficult as a child growing up because it meant that I had no strong role models. And um, my parents were in their own struggle. My dad was struggling with alcohol. And for that reason, there was a lot of violence in our household. And I'm, like I said, I'm giving you the condensed version. There are other videos and interviews that I've done where I've talked about this in more depth. But um, it wasn't easy. It was not easy at all. And I was the only daughter with three brothers. And that meant that I was raised very much like a tomboy. And um, I wasn't so connected with my female identity, my feminine identity, should I say, to um, know how to deal with my body when it changes, when you know, when you go through puberty, when I started to get my period and all of these things, there was no support around me. Um, I had to kind of figure it out. And luckily I had a teacher at school who kind of helped me understand these things, but it was, it was tough. Um, and that's just a few things about my childhood. The reason that that's relevant is because we all have difficulties that we've carried, that we've been through and that are now a part of us. We just don't know how to deal with them. And then when you come into your adult years, you look back and you think, hang on, that still hurts me. What am I supposed to do with it? Do I talk to somebody about something that happened to me when I was a child? 
Do I talk about something that happened 20, 30, 40, or however many years ago? Do those things matter now? If you're thinking about them, they matter. If they're coming into your thoughts, they matter. And that means that there's trauma within you that is yet to be healed. And the question is, are you ready to show up for yourself to do the work to heal that trauma? Because that's what your heart is asking for. That's the only reason that, that you're thinking about these things. So there are things that I've managed to work through. There are things that I haven't managed to work through and I'm still going through them. So I'm not trying to disillusion you and be here as um, an image of perfection. I am far from that. So please do not put me on any pedestals. I am just like you guys out there. Um, I just want to share some components of my journey, hoping that they might help you navigate your journey. Or even better, that you might reach out to me and we can grow in Sangat. We can make a difference together. And that would be the ideal, where we step forward to actually support each other and help each other. Now, it was those things that I was carrying from my childhood that went on with me into university, where things were unsettled and I didn't know how to configure my emotions or my life or my surroundings and belong in a world where I felt like I didn't fit in. Um, and try to merge in with people that I don't even know or connect with. So it was very, very difficult, um, but it was good. It was good because I was looking for something and I didn't stop looking. And that's one lesson I'm gonna throw out there is don't stop looking. If you've got a question, if you're on a quest, don't stop until you get the answer. Don't stop until your thirst is quenched and you feel satisfied with the information that you've received. Don't give up on yourself. So somehow I kept going and I was able to encounter the world of sick music. And this is what helped me to understand what I had been through and helped to prepare me for the things that were still yet to come in my life. Um, it was not as simple as just Geethan. You can't say that, oh, she does Geethan, and that fixed everything. Because, you know, you close your eyes magically, you do a bit of part, and everything's like, you open your eyes and everything's perfect and better, and the birds are chirping, and, you know, butterflies are flying, and there's bunny rabbits hopping around. Every it doesn't work like that. That's not life. I wish it was. I wish it was but unfortunately it's not. And you all know this as well. We have all been through difficult things and most of us have never reached out for help. I didn't because I didn't feel that anybody would understand. I tried to when I was at school. Um, I was made to see a counsellor because some of the things that were going on at home and when I went to see this counsellor at school, um, the poor lady seemed more traumatised by hearing just a fraction of what I was going through than anything else. And she had she was a white woman. She had no idea what my struggles were at home and why it was so different. Like, why I wouldn't just wear a skirt instead of wearing trousers. That was a huge deal. I got bullied at school for wanting to wear trousers because I didn't want to show my legs. I didn't want to show my legs because I didn't shave my legs. And I didn't shave my legs because at that time I was a child and my dad told me that I'm not allowed to remove my hair. And if I did, I was going to be in trouble. That was terrifying because my dad, I loved him, but he was very scary too. So I wasn't about to sneak around behind my dad's back. I didn't even know how to do that because he was just a very strong personality. And I respected him too in some way, but I guess it was part fear too. So at school, I'm walking around wearing trousers instead of skirts. And for PE, instead of wearing the little PE skirt, I wanted to wear tracksuit bottoms. And these were very difficult battles I had to have with the teachers in the school for them to understand that 
I don't come from a white family. It's not as simple as picking up a razor and just shaving my legs. I don't, firstly, I don't want to do that. I'm okay having hairy legs. I'm okay with that. But how are you going to support me? If you're a teacher, if you're in this institution, how are you going to support me? And they couldn't understand what the big deal was. They just thought my dad was very strict. He was, but I also wasn't comfortable to do that. So these little struggles add up. And when this counselor is sitting in front of me and she couldn't understand what the big deal was, that why don't I just do it behind my dad's back? That was my first and my last counseling session. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't seek counseling. I'm saying that you should, but you need to find somebody who can actually support you. And I, be, I believe and I hope that now there are a much more wider variety of trained professionals out there who are culturally sensitive or empathetic to circumstances that, may, that they may not have been through, but to understand how these things can be difficult. Um, all of those things within me kept me quiet. My voice is not something that I used to talk about what was going on. I wasn't allowed to. I wasn't allowed to tell people what was going on at home because of the shame, because of what people are going to say. How will my parents go out there and show their faces if people know what's going on at home, right? This is what we've grown up with. This is the reality of being in a Punjabi family. It can be one thing or another. And for us, it was alcohol abuse and domestic violence. So... And that was an everyday occurrence that we weren't allowed to talk about. I dealt with it. My friends, most of them had no idea what was going on. If I ever did talk about things, most of them didn't believe me. They thought I was making things up, which I learned with time to not say anything. So the quieter I went, the louder the voices inside were, the pain inside it became much louder and I was unhappy. I was always quite angry inside, just on the edge. It didn't mean that I was aggressive to people. It just meant that my demeanor and personality wasn't as compassionate or understanding as it could have been because I was hurting. So the, the saying, hurt people hurt people is true. Anybody who's behaving that way is because they're carrying pain within them that they don't know how to deal with. And simply offering some understanding or just even space to listen can make a massive difference. If somebody had have done that for me back then, who knows how different life would have been. But I was looking for a way to deal with what was going on inside me in a positive way. I was very much, um, what do I say, drawn to martial arts and these sorts of activities. I loved that sort of stuff because it helped to, di to direct my, I don't want to say aggression, but the energy of anger. And I needed something positive. And that was when I encountered this world of Sikh music. And my teacher, Professor Surinder Singh, I have been training with him for almost 18 years now to understand about myself. And that was that was one of the first things he said to me that this isn't a journey of music. It's not as simple as Geethan. This requires you to do a lot of work. Are you ready to do the work? And I asked him, will it help me? And he said, yes, it will definitely help you. And I said, what's the guarantee? How do you know it's gonna help me? And he said, because Guru Nanak says this, not me. Sarab rog ka okad naam, right? That's what Bani says, that to dispel all pain, we have the blessing of Gurbani, of naam. Gaviye suniye man rakhiye pao dukh par har sukh kar le jaye. That through singing and listening, but not just average singing and listening there's a process behind it through those processes once you understand them and connect with them what does expression mean in this context of gavier 
what does listening mean in the context of sunye how do i use it how do i use this in my life to help me to be free of the pain within me and guru nanak gives us this guarantee and i was like okay i'm willing to do the work i'm willing to try this and that was where it began and then i had a dilruba in my hand the instrument of guru gobind singh created by guru gobind singh there are six instruments that come from our guru's court five of them were created either under the instruction of our gurus or by our gurus for the purpose of helping us as humans to deal with our emotions and our real life issues now i have been to gurmukh camps i have met lots of people who talk about sikhi who talk about sikh history and do all these lectures and stuff and they're all great but this is the first person that i'm meeting in my what late teens early 20s who help me to understand how i can use gurbani as a practical tool in my life to deal with my problems and my issues and this for me was life changing it was absolutely life changing it was exactly what i needed everything that i dreamt of was this and here i was in a place to be able to receive it have you heard the word rag if you read gurbani if you've ever read any shabad there's a word rag that that is written on top of every shabad okay now that means something but nobody gives us a translation of it i have been to many different people and asked them to explain to me what that means and as in not just the word rag itself but the word that comes after it so whether that is rag asa rag suhi rag tanasri rag maj there's 60 different rags in the guru granth sahib and i was like what is this so not only were our gurus poetical geniuses imagine how much it would take for you to write a book of poetry it take a lot of work a lot of work to tell a story through poetry is not easy and if we look at the guru granth sahib we have 1430 pages of poetry which captures so much values for us to adopt in our lives teachings to help us deal with our problems moods that we relate to that's what rag means there is a musical element to this word rag that you use particular notes to evoke this specific mood but there is the emotional side which we call musicology that helps us to relate to that feeling so the lung this is a rag which carries the feeling of being unappreciated where you've done something for somebody from a good place in your heart with the best intention you gave it your all and the person didn't appreciate it now it doesn't mean you're going to hate the person it doesn't mean you're going to dislike them or stop talking to them but it means for a moment you're going to feel a little hurt and that hurt is the lung and guru sahib writes bani in this rag like i said there's 59 more like this and when they were what do i say translated to me in this way that i can relate to it was life changing to know that already throughout your life each of you have lived these 60 rags again and again and again and again all you have to do is learn what the they each mean and then you categorize your life experiences into these 60 little pigeon holes it means that you've got the foundation layer sorted okay you've got your first step of connection sorted your next step is to connect to the shabad how does that shabad written in that mood 
now translate to you? Because when you don't take into context the meaning of the rag, you cannot fully connect to the Shabbat or translate the Shabbat. You don't get the full context. So the reason that the gurus assigned rags to every Shabbat, except for Japji and the Salok, Vara and Vadik at the end of Guru Granth Sahib, the rest of Guru Granth Sahib is written in rag. Therefore, as a seeker, as a Sikh, it's our responsibility to learn what that means. If we want to connect the questions coming in earlier, how do we have the conversations with our elders? We have to make an effort. We have to be willing to learn and to listen. If you want to make a connection with Guru Granth Sahib, if you want to understand how you live that Shabbat and how that Shabbat is going to help you, you have to be willing to learn and to listen. That requires doing some unlearning as well, absolutely. But in order to go in, you have to have the willingness to be open and make that connection and do that work. It wasn't easy for me to have to create these pigeonholes, these 60 pigeonholes of my life and put in stories that were painful, that I've lived through my experiences into those different boxes. But if I didn't do it, I didn't have any other option. What else was I going to do? So I gave it a chance. And the outcome was incredible. The outcome is this right in front of you. I wouldn't be this person had I not have had that technology to help me to understand how to configure it. The Dilruba allowed me to learn to use my voice. Often when we talk to somebody, words are they're restricted. We can't say everything that we want to say through words. Why do you scream? Why do you yell? Why do you laugh really loud? Why can't we express those things in words? Because words have a limit. And music or sound does not have any limit. This is why, this is why our gurus who were geniuses, masters of music and poetry and everything else that they were, they gave us Guru Granth Sahib written in a way that our emotions can connect with, moods that we experience, that they experienced too. They wrote Gurbani in those rags. So when we read a Shabad in that rag, and we've got a story that connects to that mood of that rag, we've already got a connection. If I say to you, Rag Tanasri, right now you're thinking, I don't even know what that means. I've heard it, I might have read it, I don't know what it means. Rag Tanasri is that feeling of being carefree. Those exercises that people do for team building when you have to stand and then fall and the person behind catches you and you hope that they don't drop you, right? There's an element of trust. There's a huge element of trust, right? In tenacity, change that human for the creator, for a Kaal Purk, knowing that every time you fall, that Guru's got your back. It's going to be okay. It might feel like you've hit rock bottom, but you haven't. Because if that faith is there in your heart, if that love is there and you can connect with the Nasri, you know that regardless of whatever the outcome, whatever happens, whether it goes your way or not, it's going to be okay because Guru's got your back. Imagine that feeling. You can relate to it as a child. If you had older siblings, you'd go and seek protection behind them when you feel that you're you know, at risk or you're going to be hurt or you're in trouble. When you're at school, if something's going on, you would probably hide behind your parents. And when you're holding their hand and walking down the street, you feel like no one can touch you. Now imagine living your whole life with that feeling, how different your life would be, how different you would be. When you have that confidence of the Nasri, that you've got that connection with Guru and Guru's going to look after you. That's life-changing. So when you now hear a Shabbat in Raag Danasari or read a Shabbat in Raag Danasari, I want you to think of that feeling. I want you to close your eyes and have that feeling in your heart as you're listening. 
as you're allowing the Shabbat to penetrate your body and your mind and your soul to purify everything that's going on inside you. Now, to hit the next level, there's levels to this, okay? The first level is understanding and making basic connection. The second level is going to be listening, where we try to relate to it and make those connections. Third level, let's say, is going to be where you dive in, you immerse yourself into this space. And that immersion requires you to believe in yourself. When you know that you're worthy of greatness, when you know that you deserve this, you have all the tools within you to achieve every single thing that you want. You just need the guidance. You need a coach. And your coach is Gurbani. You put your Dilruba on your shoulder and you're singing, you're singing from your mouth a Shabad that is not just written in Rag Tanasari, but you're also playing the notes of Rag Tanasari on your Dilruba. Your body's engaged. Okay, so now the body is there, the mind is there because it's thinking about your story and your connection of when you felt that in your life, then your soul is immersed. Your soul is singing the Shabbat. Now, all of the components of you are present in this moment. And that is when the magic happens. That is when the miracles happen. I don't actually believe in miracles, but... What Guru does in that moment when you are fully immersed in this and you show up for yourself, the pain that you carry, when you sing it out through the Shabbat, through the expression of the sound carried through the Dilruba, merging with your voice, protected by the wisdom of Gurbani, that is how the healing happens. That is how your heart can transform from feeling hurt and worn down and exhausted and in pain to blossoming and feeling love and joy and goodness again. When we think about the Sikhs from history, this was what they had. They had a sword in their hand, but they had a Dilruba on their back. That was how they went into battle. We're missing our tools. That's the missing connection. We're missing the tools to help us achieve that greatness. And I'm asking you to step in for yourself. Show up for you and make that connection. By no means am I saying this is the only way. There are plenty of ways out there. I'm sharing with you what worked for me. I'm sharing with you what worked for our gurus and for those great shaheeds and martyrs that we read about in our history of Sikhi. They had something that we don't have. They had a connection with Guru. And this was their connection. They did their duk and their sukh with Guru. This is the way that they did it. They didn't need to pay the gyanni at the Gurdwara to do the irdas for them. They did the irdas themselves. They didn't need to hire somebody to come and do kirtan at their function. They picked up their dilruba and they did kirtan. Because kirtan is something that is a part of your wellness, your individual wellness and your success. That's how you can achieve it. That was the purpose of kirtan. That's how it was given to us. Nobody's ever shared it with me in that way that I had experienced but because I know that it works. That's why I want to share it with you. That's why I want you all to feel the same joy that I felt and experience that same transformation that I did because a lot of the things that I've been through, I wouldn't have been able to survive if I didn't have this. And like I said to you, I, I found this partway through my journey. And it was helping me deal with the trauma that I'd already experienced, but preparing me for the difficulties that were yet to come. And there were more challenges while I was still on this path and I'm still on this path and I'm still learning. I'm pretty sure there's going to be more challenges yet to come, but I know that I'm going to get through. I know that it's going to be okay because I've got that tenacity. 
and I've got 59 more connections with my emotions that are going to help me to configure what's going to go on on those roads and paths ahead that I can't see yet. There are still so many more questions that I would like to answer. Um, I think we're going to wrap up pretty soon. So I'm going to look into the comments and see what questions have rolled in from you today. Let's have a look. Where did I learn Kirtan from? From Professor Surinder Singh. And he started a wonderful organization called Raj Academy. He founded this in England and he elevated the education of Sikh music into the academic arena by creating university and college level courses that are dedicated just to Sikh music. So I had the great fortune of being able to study my bachelor's in Sikh music in London. I studied my master's, which is in Nath Yoga, that means Sikh music therapy in London. And this is now my professional career. I am a professional Sikh music therapist. And it is, it is such a, an honor and a privilege to be able to say that. Um, but I wouldn't have been able to say these words or have that experience had Professor Surinder Singh Ji not have done the work that he did to revive these instruments and create structured education for the revival of the, not just the practice of the instruments, but the practice of connecting with rag and Shabad and our own experiences. So that's where I've learned from. I, I invite you to reach out to the team at Raj Academy. We've got some free courses available. If you want to be in contact and you want that information, please drop us an email. I'm going to drop you in the, in the comments to hello at rajacademy.com. Okay. So if you send an email there, they will send you access to free courses that you can study and learn from your own home. All of the learning is online. Um, we've tried to do a lot of work around reviving um, the whole history and the story of Sikh music when it comes from this angle, not looking at it from the lens of Indian classical music, but as an independent genre, as the gurus created it of Sikh music. Um, we um, made recently a documentary and I will share the link for that documentary. It's called Sikh Musical Heritage, The Untold Story. And it's a journey of the birth, the demise and the revival of Sikh music. It will help you to get a clearer understanding of what the gurus created, why they created these instruments and how we can use them without me having to do that whole lecture for you here. It's much more entertaining than I would be. So please, if you want to support this cause of reviving sick music, then I, I invite you to watch the documentary and share your questions. Reach out to the team at Raj Academy. Let us know how we can support you and how we can help you or your community to connect with these teachings of the gurus. Um, I was fully supported by Professor Surinder Singh Ji in my journey. There's not many women in the Kirtan space. And I didn't realize that until I was in those spaces, in rooms full of men, older men. And there was just a very, you know, what do I say, a typical appearance that that we see everywhere we see two harmoniums and a tabla and three men on a stage we don't see women the only women that you might see might be the sister or the daughter of the main person sitting there now we're seeing more women come forward into this space but the question is why weren't they there before and it's because those spaces were not safe and women were not given a voice so this is the reform that we need. We're seeing it happen. We still need a lot of work around it and we need that support for us to gather together. I know I keep saying that, but that is the only way that we can actually make change. Okay, I am just rolling through some of your questions. What is a good source to read or learn about the gurus and Sikhs who lived in the times of the gurus. There are, there are many out there. Um, I'm going to say if you, you know, you can look um, 
I think any books about Sikh history, you'll find a lot of information out there um, that's going to give you an understanding. It's it's not as simple as just one resource. There's many, but you have to keep searching. One thing that I found in my journey is that never take everything that you read at face value, sorry, on the surface, don't take that as the truth. So whatever comes as face value, there's more to the story. There's always more to the story. Are you willing to do the work? Are you willing to research more and go deeper and understand what the truth actually was versus what you see? So just because the majority lean a particular way doesn't mean that that's the truth. Um, that's what I discovered when I was researching into Sikh music history, it's what I discovered when I was re researching about the Sikh gurus as well. That's why my opinions are very different to most people. I'm not here to offend you, but I'm sharing with you things that I have encountered and learnt through my research. So um, I hope that this is helpful for all of you. Um, I've shared the link to the documentary. It would mean the world to me if you were to go and watch the documentary and open that dialogue. It would mean so much to me if you were to reach out to me and support us. We're looking for volunteers. We're looking for passionate, dedicated volunteers who can help us to further all of the work that we're doing. Um, I'm involved with Raj Academy. I'm involved with Core Voices. Um, I, I try to do whatever I can do to create change, to share our stories, lift each other up and support each other through healing. I use Sikh music as a tool for healing. That was how it was intended by our gurus. That is how we should continue to keep that legacy alive of what Sikh music is. It's not music for entertainment. It's not music that will just work with your fingers crossed and eyes closed, hoping that magically something's going to change. It requires us to do work. Therapy requires us to do work. Guru Nanak asked us to do work. Are you willing to do the work to show up for yourself? That's the question. Are you willing to pick up a Dilruba and help configure your emotions and put into context all of the trauma and the pain that you might be carrying within you? Are you ready to let it go? Because that's what will happen. When you start this journey of sick music, it's going to help you to reduce that, that weight, that baggage of the pain. And you're going to emerge a different person, a lighter being, a happier being. Do you want that? Are you ready for that? Because if you are, then I'm here to support you. I want you to reach out to me. I am going to drop you my email here, corevoices at gmail.com. You'll be able to get in touch with me and my wonderful team. We are looking for support. We need volunteers. We need you to come forward and reach out in any capacity that you're able to help. Please send us an email. If you're willing to support us to advocate for any of the issues that we've talked about or even issues we haven't talked about, but that we should be bringing reform on, please reach out to me. Let me be there for you. And if you are a part of of my team, then I get a chance to work with you and mentor you as well, which I would be delighted to do if I can offer any support in your journey and in your development. This hour went by very fast and I'm very, very grateful for each of you for to listen to me for an hour. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you so much for, for rolling in with the questions and helping me stay connected with you. I hope that we can do more shows like this where you get to ask me questions directly and we can address issues. If there are more things that you want to know about me, you know how to contact me, okay? Corevoices at gmail.com. Thank you for being here. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for your support and for your love. And together, if we stand together and support each other, we can make a difference. We can make a change. Reach out. And let's make that change. Thank you so much for tuning in to Core Voices. You guys have been wonderful. Thank you so much. And see you next week. <laughs>